Uh, good afternoon. Can I welcome Can I welcome everyone to the uh, Is this on? It is. Uh, welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2015. Please switch off all mobile phones and other online devices completely. Uh, no apologies have been received. We've been joined by Christian Allard and by Graham Pearson. Can I just say to the two gentlemen that I will uh, let members have their questions first because it's a very specifically appointed committee. So, um, but you're welcome to come in if you have got some time. Um, item one: The subcommittee is invited to agree to consider item three in our work programme in private. Are you agreed? Thank you. Item two, um, and this must conclude by 2.15 uh, when the Chamber sits at, uh, later, to, just shortly afterwards. Uh, it's an evidence session on the latest developments in relation to armed police, and I welcome Ian White, SPA board member who chairs its recent inquiry into the public impact of Police Scotland's Standing Firearms Authority, Deputy Chief Constable Ian Livingston, Crime and Operational Support, Assistant Chief Constable Bernard Higgins, Operational Support, Derek Penman, HM Inspector Ken Stanley in Scotland, who also recently reported in the Standing Firearms Authority. Uh, members of copies of the reports, which I've mentioned, I thank you all very much for coming today. And as usual, I go straight to questions from members, John Finney, uh, 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 Kevin and Margaret and Elaine and then Alison. Okay. Thank you, convener. Uh, afternoon, panel. I I've got some questions for Mr White, if I may, please. Mr White, um, the report that was published inquiring into the public impact of Police Scotland's Firearms Standing Authority, wh why was that published late? It well, sorry, I'm being here before Mr. White. You yes. need to press buttons in so, here. Sorry, OK. We have a lovely gentleman who's put you I'm online. I'm just indicate when you're... If a question's come to you directly, answer it. Otherwise, if you want to come in, indicate, and I'll call you. Mr. White. Thank, thank you, convener. I'm used to other places where you do have to press buttons, so that's, <laughs> that's the nature of it. Um, we, we were delayed slightly by uh, a number of factors, but we wanted to make sure that we had a, a full review of the information that had come to us. And we wanted to make sure that we could publish a report that balanced the rather uh, slightly conflicting information that had come to us from different sources and put that out in a way that was appropriate with uh, the role we have, which is about uh, making sure we can have continuous improvement in policing in Scotland. Who saw the report in advance of it being published, Mr White? Well, a number of stakeholders saw the report uh, for reasons of checking for factual accuracy. So uh, I, I think uh, ACC Higgins and his staff saw it to check for factual accuracy, particularly around a lot of the terms that are in there. Uh, and Mr Penman saw it, of course, because uh, we had done undertaken complementary work where uh, his work was on the policing specifics of the matter and ours were very much more about the uh, public view of uh, armed policing. Is that the complete list of people who saw the report for um, publication? I think, uh, I think some colleagues in our sponsor department in Scottish Government may have seen it too. Uh, and when you say accuracy, was that th these are simple facts rather than opinion or, con or comment on your conclusions? Well, we work in, in uh, a collaborative way, uh, so we, we wanted to make sure that uh, everything we had by way of evidence was accurate and appropriate, and then we came to a judgment uh, based on that, and that is then the report which was unanimously agreed by the scrutiny panel members and has subsequently been endorsed by the SPA board. And in, in that respect, we took account of all the evidence we had and balanced that. And so uh, it's based on the information in our, our different sources, whether that came from the public attitude survey, whether it came from people uh, giving us written evidence, whether, like you yourself, people came along and gave us evidence in person at open sessions that were available mm -hmm. and still available on the web for people to view, uh, and indeed the academic report that we commissioned. So the report is based around those pieces of information. There were some factual things that we wanted to check with other partners, and that is why it was released to them. No, I, I can understand some of the technical information. You want to clarify you'd got it exactly right. That's not what I was asking, Mr White. I was asking if the conclusions in any way were the subject of consultation with the people you're writing the report about. The, the conclusions and uh, recommendations were in the report. 
uh, as it was circulated, but uh, they, were, they were not for consultation in that way. It was consultation on factual accuracy, and uh, the conclusions are based on uh, the, the group's view of the evidence we had before us. So if it was suggested that the delay for the report, and it was to have come out on the 17th or 18th of December, it was suggested that the delay was because Police Scotland were demanding a rewrite. Well, if, if that was the case, that never came to me. And would you have anticipated that coming to you? I would have thought so, but uh, actually it wouldn't have been something that we would have considered as such. And, and I can tell you that as we went through uh, a few different drafts for our own internal review uh, for, for uh, factual accuracy and other things, the one thing I can be absolutely certain about is that the conclusions and recommendations didn't change. They didn't change at all? Uh, there may have been minor wording changes that, that we uh, anticipated as we worked through. Bear in mind, some of this was drafted by SPA officers and then reviewed by the board members so that it was a report that we endorsed and, and approved. Uh, and so we had our own internal uh, wording changes around that. But the conclusions and recommendations, uh, as, as I recall, uh, didn't change through that process. Did anyone other than your inquiry influence any of the wording in the conclusions? Not that I'm aware of. But Mr White, you're the, you're the chair of this group. Surely you would be aware of it if it had happened. Well, I should be, and I'm not aware of that happening. That's what I'm saying to you. And one of the ways you would be aware is if there was a discrepancy before, between what you understood to be your final report and what we have in front of us here. Well, yes, but as I said... So there I've is said, no such we discrepancies? Went... In, in what sense? What kind of discrepancy are you suggesting, Mr Finney? No, I'm, I'm saying to you, you, you're saying not to your knowledge there's any changes. Well, presumably, being the there chair, were, there you were know the There were changes as we went through a drafting process. I myself made changes and suggestions, uh, as did my colleagues on the panel. And we went through a drafting process where SBA officers also made suggested changes at different points. And we had feedback uh, from, from other colleagues. Uh, and I think... Uh, Mr Penman uh, particularly had some constructive feedback for us around a lot of the issues because our reports were complementary and some of the issues he'd looked at uh, to some extent in advance and we had to make sure that uh, the, the two didn't, uh, as it were, uh, completely conflict with each other unless there was something on which we disagreed and actually we didn't in the end. But, but uh, so we had to check around those things. You were undertaking a different report from Mr Penman. Yes, although so some, some of the issues that were in our remit, uh, I, I could say, uh, to some extent, uh, had been strayed into by the, the conclusions of Mr Penman's report. I think the thrust is, well, there might have been technical changes in, in conclusions and recommendations, um, that none of these uh, were substantive, well, having been seen by other parties. That's correct, convener, and if... if if anything, I think the conclusions and recommendations from an early draft are the thing that most stayed the same. But the group ourselves, uh, we were, we were uh, concerned throughout with the write-up of some of the evidence and, and other bits to get that right. The so narrative. That it's the narrative, so that it fully, uh, fully supported the right. conclusions and recommendations. And that's where the biggest changes were, were undertaken through the drafting well, we've process. Well, got that on the record now, Kevin. Well... Oh, just okay. come, yeah, well, I was going to, in terms of time, you've got another point to make, so continue well, along that line. One several more? other points to make. On the same thing? Yeah, on the same thing, yeah. And, and it is about the position. Mr White, are you able to narrate the position? Because your report talks about the position pre-1st of April 2013. What was the position regarding the deployment of armed officers across Scotland pre-1st of April 2013? Well, That's a key date, obviously, in there. It, it is. Um, actually, that was much better articulated in Mr Penman's report. Did I ask you, and Mr we, Well, I, I, my, I believe that the uh, articulation of it in Mr Penman's report is absolutely accurate, um, from all the evidence I've seen, too. But what was the position? Because what's, what's key, and, and I think time's going to preclude me asking, because I could spend all afternoon asking questions about the various versions we've heard of when things change. What was your understanding of the position prior to the 1st of April 2013 regarding the deployment of armed officers? 
Okay, in uh, Strathclyde Police Area, the officers had been deployed uh, in a similar way uh, with a standing authority and uh, were attending what you and I would think of as more routine incidents. Uh, and that was, I th my recollection is, may have been back to 2009, 10, 11, something like that. There was a standing authority for firearms officers in armed response vehicles in Tayside Police Authority area. Uh, and they, but they had a different method of carriage of the firearms. They carried them in a covert holster. Uh, and they also attended more, some more routine incidents. And there was a change in the northern area uh, to that position uh, shortly before the uh, 1st of April 2013, so maybe in February, early March. In the other areas, Can Dumfries... Can you talk me through that change then, how that came about? Because there are different versions of how that came how about. How that came about. My understanding is that the Chief Constable of Northern Constabulary made that change. And there was a report and to... Who, just for the avoidance of doubt, who is that individual? Was that Mr Graham you're talking about? Mr George uh, Graham? Yes. Right. Yes. He made that change on he, February or March 2013? Yes. So, not Mr House at some other date? No. And that's, that's your understanding? That's my understanding. Okay. But, uh, but you have to bear in mind <clears throat> that that was prior to the Scottish Police Authority taking any oversight and governance in that way. Yes, but, but your, your report is about the genesis of this whole issue, and yes. you do allude to the situation. That's why I absolutely understand but that you take... We allude to it, but we also relied, to some extent, because of the complementary nature of our reports, on the information that was gathered by Mr Penman's report in order to come to our understanding of that part of the reporting. Do you think there's clarity in the public eye, Mr White, as to who actually initiated this decision in relation to former Northern, now N Division, uh, who was consulted on it and uh, how the whole process ran? Uh, no, I don't think there is. Um, is that and not the purpose of your report, to absolutely yes. highlight how that came about? Uh, the, the purpose of our report was to determine what the public view was around the deployment that had taken place under Police Scotland and to look at how we could improve methods of informing the public around these things in future. In fact, I'll take you to our, uh, our uh, issues that we wanted to look at, the nature and level of the public concerns over the firearms uh, deployment under the Standing Authority, how effectively yes, Police Scotland had engaged... Okay. I, I won't I, make you read through, because that's yep. your introduction, page 252, number 2 in your introduction, correct, which anyone convener. can read. I'm sorry I'm cut curtailing you a wee bit, but, John, I'll let you come back in later, but I'm going to have to let other members in, because we have only an hour and a quarter, and I've got a whole pile of people. I've got Kevin, <laughs> Margaret, Elaine, Alison, and back to you, John. Can I ask um, the uh, police officers here uh, what kind of threats um, police officers face on a weekly uh, basis which may require firearms deployment? I'll maybe kick off on that, if, if, if I may. I mean, we've seen the threat level against international terrorism rise to severe in the last year, and that is a, a significant uh, reality. I think what's important as well to note is that the, the threat level against police officers has gone up. Uh, quite unprecedented in my experience in the police service that, that against police officers themselves, that is also now at severe, and that's clearly a factor that we need to build in to the, the, the deployment methods that we have, and the fact that we need to maintain a specialist firearms capability to protect the vast, overwhelming majority of unarmed officers, and it is overwhelmingly an unarmed service that we have. In addition to that, we know the threat from serious organised crime is significant, and, and that doesn't just... Uh, uh, relate or confine itself to the central belt. Um, I think there was even some, some coverage this morning in, in today's media um, of a significant uh, crime group from London targeting St Andrews of all places um, uh, in regard to, to some crime. We've just completed Operation Cambridge where there was a serious and organised crime group from Merseyside who had access to firearms were specifically targeting the north of Scotland. Um, and, and by their own admission, because they thought it might, they thought it might have been easier, but softer up, up in the north than it would have been um, in, in the central belt. So the threats uh, against police officers are, are real. 
the threats against our communities are real. And, and what we think we've done with the, 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 the dedicated ARV policy that we have is that we think we've built a proportionate response to that threat. It's a tiny minority of police officers who we have within those units, um, and they're there to protect and ensure the fact that the vast, overwhelming majority of our officers are unarmed and remain unarmed. But we do need that capability to counter some of the threats I've just outlined. You mentioned St Andrews there, um, DCC Livingston, and I have that press report in front of me, funnily enough, where six folk were arrested, including a 16-year-old boy. Um, and I think for some members of the public, they would find it quite hard to believe that such things would happen in a, a small place like St Andrews. But is it the case that these kind of incidents could happen anywhere in the country at all? That, 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 that's exactly the point. I mean, it is a it's very atypical very atypical uh, scenario that, that, that arose, but it's critical that wherever such situations arise, that we've got that capability and capacity to respond to it. Mr. Mr Finney was asking about you know, what was the position prior to, to 1st of April 2013, and, and in many ways that gets to the essence of where, where we were. It, it was a mixed position. It was a mixed bag. Some areas of Scotland at that time had no ARV capability. Some areas had a mixed, a mixed capability between roads policing and armed officers, so somebody could be involved standing at a side of a, of a road accident with, with weaponry. Some force areas had no ARV capability. So when we looked at Scotland as a whole, we needed to make sure that everybody had that equal access and, and that, level, that same level of protection. But it was done in a, in a proportionate manner against the threat as we assessed that. But of course, since that date, the threat has actually increased. Okay. And, and the threat, the threat, the threat, is, the threat is, is real. And it does, it does extend beyond the traditional central belt area. Um, in October 2014, there was the change. Uh, and the Chief Constable announced that firearms officers attached to armed response vehicles would now only be deployed to firearms incidents or where there is a threat to life. Now, from what you're saying, um, there may be officers deployed throughout the country, sometimes in rural areas. Uh, during the course of their, uh, their duties, uh, what other things can they undertake while they are patrolling in an armed response vehicle. <clears throat> Certainly, Mr. Stewart. I mean, you're, you're quite correct. What we um, advised in October that the armed response vehicles would deal with firearms operations, any other threat to life incidents that, that um, uh, they are made aware of. For example, there have been a number of suicide interventions um, where the, the firearms officers have been the first responders. There have been a number of critical medical situations where the firearms officers who have enhanced first aid skills and, and carry defibrillator equipment have deployed and literally saved people's lives. Um, and what we also ask them is that whilst they are not tasked and deployed by area control rooms, um, we ask them to use their professional judgment um, over any other uh, instances that they may come across during the tour of their duty. Um, they are still police officers, and if they see a crime uh, being committed in front of them, then my expectation of them, as I would expect to any uh, member of the public, is that they will deal with that crime. And there have been a number of occasions where they have um, caught people in the proceeds of, of committing a housebreaking uh, and other similar crimes. So they, they have to rely on their professional judgment before they respond to such things. Yeah. Um, would there maybe be a reticence to do, uh, do, to do some of these things now that there has been such a furore over uh, armed police being found at certain places? No, I, I, don't, I don't believe there is. Um, firearms officers, by their very nature, receive significant training. Uh, they undergo significant refresher training on a, an annual basis where they have to demonstrate significant levels of situational judgment um, um, and that is tested in a training environment. To some degree, you could say that they are tested and trained to a higher degree than any other officer for the particular specialism that they have. When they're out in the streets of Scotland, they will apply the same principles um, of their decision-making model to what they see in front of them as they would to uh, a firearms operation that they have been dispatched to. Is there any way at all um, that processes can be put in place so that these officers can be called upon for general duties 
um, without firearms uh, being on display, which is obviously of concern to some members of the public? Yeah, certainly that um, kind of goes into the, the two areas uh, which are currently under consideration um, as a result of uh, Mr Penman and, and Mr White's report in terms of the, the firearms uh, mode of carriage, uh, which, as we know just now, is currently overt, and also what duties they can engage in when they're not employed uh, in firearms uh, duties. Um, that report has now been provided to me, and in line with the uh, agreed protocols, uh, they will now be considered internally by Police Scotland before further engagement um, with the, the SPA and other stakeholders. Um, but there are opportunities for us to explore uh, both the areas that you talk about. Um, and just for the record, how many officers at this moment um, are trained to deal with firearms and how many frontline officers are there currently deployed by Police Scotland? OK, I'll give you the, the absolute accurate figures. So what we have, um, the total number of authorised firearms officers, and that is both dedicated and, and non-dedicated, is um, 538. Now, that is broken down further um, in armed response vehicles uh, at this moment in time. Uh, the, the figure taken this morning, we have 268 full-time armed response vehicle officers. Uh, in addition of that, we have um, 48 training instructors who are also qualified armed, uh, armed officers and a number of more specialist uh, firearms officers um, who uh, are also full-time firearms but not routinely deployed in ARV duties. Thank you. Thank you, convener. A couple of things. Is that up or down in the past year, um, these the, figures? The, 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 the figure can vary literally on a, a daily basis, convener. Um, being a firearms officer is a, a, a volunteer status. Um, officers sometimes decide after a number of years that they've paid their dues and they wish to go and do something else, so they will um, remove themselves from firearms duties, they transfer to other, uh, other areas, they retire from the police service. Um, a week ago we had 274 uh, firearms, or sorry, armed response vehicle officers due to a, a number of issues. That figure has reduced to 268. On the 30th of March, there is an internal transfer parade, which will see that figure rise. <coughs> um, but the baseline figure is roughly uh, 275, is, is where we sit at for the, the armed response vehicle officers. And the quick supplementary to other members, is the time scale for this report that you're going to circulate internally then to the SPA? The, the time scales, convener, it will go internally to Mr Livingston's Gold Group on the 11th of March. Uh, it will then, subject to discussions at the uh, Gold Group on the 11th of March, be presented to the Sorry. Senior Leadership Board uh, on the 18th of March. And thereafter, again, subject to the discussions there, I believe it's um, notionally going to be provided to the, the Police Authority at the meeting at the end of March. And the other thing is, um, obviously this committee would be very interested in uh, seeing that as well, because we have a role scrutinising not just yourselves, Police Scotland, but also the SPA. Yeah. So I take it, yes? So, no, sorry, Convener, just to say that, I mean, Bernie's absolutely right about where we're going to take it in, by the end of this month. Thereafter, this is going to be the, the test of, of how we've changed in terms of the engagement and the visibility and the transparency of, of the issue, because the challenge to us has been that the, the standing authority was introduced and people didn't have that awareness, and Mr Finney's made that clear. So if we are going to change from the position that we've adopted in October of last year, that we only deploy to threats to, to life, to firearms jobs or any spontaneous incident that requires intervention that the officers come upon, and we've got an overt carriage, so those are the two issues, the deployment and the yes. carriage. If we're going to change that, we will make sure that we're going to go and engage, and quite clearly the members of this committee, both as a committee but also as in terms of their own parliamentary duties and the communities they represent, have to be part of that. So, so this, this work that, that Bernie's already commissioned, this will be a test for us about how we're then going to engage, go and engage in a, in a way that's better than we did previously, which, which we accept. Can Very you, quickly. Uh, uh, point of clarification, could you maybe tell us what the gold group that you head up, DC Livingston, actually is? No. I, I, could you, I, well, I mean, it's, not a, it's not a collective I don't know what it here. is. Um, is that a short answer? It, it's, it's a strategic overview group that I, I lead 
that has everybody within Police Scotland on it to, to manage the two reports. So we have an action plan that has been commissioned through that, that meets regularly and has a level of, of, of grip and authority over the firearms uh, work within Police Scotland, recognising the level of interest. So it, it's, a, it's an internal governance structure that's in place and, and has, a, has a degree of discipline attached to it. Thank you. Margaret, followed by Elaine. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Communication is a key theme in the SPA report. It's also highlighted in the HMIC report. Um, and in the specific issue of the deployment of armed police, then it's clear that this wasn't sufficient, lacking in context. As a result of this report, and particularly in terms of the oversight body, which I don't think is covered in Police Scotland's strategy, two-pronged strategy, looking at external and internal communication, how is that going to be resolved so that there is meaningful communication, not after the fact, but um, before anything is decided? If, if, if I may, I, I would say that is probably the key thing that we uh, brought out from the report that we undertook through SPA, uh, and that is that communication should be strengthened and improved, and that's all part of ensuring that policing works with the consent of the public in Scotland. Uh, it, it's interesting because Mr Finney asked me earlier about public knowledge around some of this, and even after the, the media and, and public interest there was last can, year, can, can our, our opinion survey found... So, you finish briefly then, Ian. Don't be too anxious, you've all got ten minutes each. Right. It Margaret. wasn't public communication, it's covered there, I see there's a strategy to cover it, I see there's community impact, it's excellent, but key and germane to this is the role of SPA as the oversight body mm. and the communication with Police Scotland. How is that going to be improved? Okay, I'll maybe stick, stick to that, convener. Uh, part of what we recommended is, was that there was a new agreement between the Police Authority and Police Scotland on how we would uh, hear about issues uh, in advance where there was significant public interest and that uh, Police Scotland would bring those openly to the authority so that we could then assist uh, with uh, ensuring that the public were aware of those issues and can have their say on them. To do that, we have concluded a joint agreement between the Authority and Police Scotland, which I believe you will have seen and which was uh, agreed jointly at our board meeting uh, recently. Uh, that was endorsed and uh, supported by the Chief Constable at that meeting, and we now have to uh, implement that agreement and ensure that that uh, work is taken forward. As part of that, Police Scotland also brought a communications engagement strategy, and that backs up the work. Uh, I, I think I referred we, to that. That we, was a two-pronged strategy, two -prong internal, strategy. external. My focus is specifically in SPA. Could you give me some examples of how uh, this is going to work, this communication, which is absolutely fundamental um, in a single police force that there is a, an effective oversight body? I, I really want some reassurance on that, uh, how that's being tackled. Well, that's, that's being tackled, uh, convener, through the joint agreement on police policy engagement, which came to our February board specifics. meeting. The specifics are that the Chief Constable has agreed jointly with us that where there is any issue that uh, we uh, foresee will have uh, any kind of significant public interest, that he will bring that to the board uh, as a matter of course prior uh, to any implementation of policy change. But the problem is, as um, Mr Emery confirmed on stop of search, then every single time it's been after the event, what checks and balances are in place to ensure it's not going to continue in that way? Well, this, this agreement has only just taken place, and in terms of monitoring that, that's a test for the future, and I think there are, there are a, a couple of obvious tests for that for the future. The first is uh, the one that the Deputy Chief Constable just described, that were they to make any further changes to firearms deployment policy, we would fully expect that they bring that uh, to the SPA as a policy change that they would engage with us and as through discussion with us engage further with the public of Scotland. Similarly, a, a, a good example that we highlighted in our report was uh, there may be a forthcoming proposal at some point for uh, body-worn cameras to be uh, worn by police officers, issued to police officers throughout Scotland. We would fully expect that if there were a policy change like that, the Chief Constable would bring that as 
a, a matter for prior engagement to the board so that issues uh, around that could be addressed and then raised publicly uh, to gain public support and to ensure that there were no uh, unfavourable impacts from that policy. Mr. Penman, and if yep. you want to come in there as well. Thank you. It's just, just relating to that very point uh, around something we identified in one of our recommendations. It's a key issue about how do you bring those things forward. And our recommendation was to ask the authority and Police Scotland to develop that agreement. You asked about checks and balances. I think we, HMIC, will have a role now that there's clarity around what both the authority and Police Scotland say they intend to do around that early engagement. Uh, I'll certainly be looking to see that that is complied with. Now we have some clarity about what would be there, and I would be looking to report publicly should they fall short on that. Mm. I can't say I'm altogether um, really um, optimistic. Yeah. Is the word you're looking for, Margaret? <laughs> or reassured. Yes. Can I just ask him one other thing? Mm -hmm. um, key to this whole thing was the insistence from the Chief Constable um, till a very late stage that this was an operational matter and not a policy matter. It clearly was a policy matter. And I notice in um, paragraph 39, the summary of findings, a definition of operational should not be too rigid. We need to establish clear working protocols. Inside that and outside that gobbledygook, what exactly does that mean and what will, um, what will stop the same thing happening again? This is operation, not policy. Oops, really, it was policy. Well, Convener, uh, we, we shied away in our report from defining operational independence because like uh, a number of members of this committee who've sat on the Justice Committee for some time, we felt that actually that would be unhelpful to future scrutiny. Uh, the, the trouble is, if you define it too far, you leave a number of things in the remit of the Chief Constable without any other scrutiny around them. And we wanted a very open definition, because some matters, while they there will be operational imperatives for the Chief Constable to take action, uh, will require scrutiny after the fact too. But we were also very clear, and the joint agreement we have, and the Chief Constable fully supports this too, and, and has said so publicly at our board meeting, those commit us to having prior engagement on, on issues that we want to take forward. Um, in uh, the focus on that, we want clear working protocols. We believe we have those in place. They're backed up by Police Scotland's communication and engagement strategy, which, as you've heard, Mr Penwin will, will look at and look at what we do on that. But we also wish to put in place uh, a, a monitoring process uh, about how they are implementing that strategy. And we will do that on a regular basis uh, over the coming months and years. And we, we want to see evidence that the work highlighted there, the actions and the implementation are being taken forward. And of course, time uh, is what will test this in, in practice, convener. Uh, there is always the possibility that there is something that uh, Police Scotland do not see as being immediately of public interest. I think there are uh, mindset changes around some of that that are already taking place in Police Scotland uh, and have done through uh, this issue around uh, uh, firearms carriage, which uh, from the previous uh, method that things were done in Strathclyde, where it was introduced uh, with, uh, without any particular public uh, engagement, there was an expectation that that would uh, flow through to the rest of Scotland and there wouldn't be an issue of concern. Clearly, there was very much an issue of public concern in different parts of Scotland, and we would wish to prevent something like that happening again without proper scrutiny. We as the SPA have learnt from that, and I believe Police Scotland have too, Convener. Happy to Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Elaine, followed by Alison. Uh, thank you. Before I get on to sort of more general issues, can I just confirm, in answer to Mr Stewart's question about what would happen since the decision had been reversed in terms of uh, the uh, deployment routine, uh, the deployment of armed uh, officers on routine patrols. If, in the situation you were suggesting, where uh, somebody, an armed officer, attended something like a break-in because it happened to be occurring near him, is it not the case now that the firearms would re remain locked in the armed re response vehicle rather than being carried overtly? Uh, no, that's not correct. The, the officers will be carrying their, their sidearm and their taser. And is that different to... Was, that, was it not the case prior to the decision being made on no. routine... That always happened that they always carried... Uh, 
Yes, from, from the 1st of April 2013, every mm. armed response officer in Police Scotland has carried a sidearm and taser. Yeah, and prior to that, any, prior to that, what happened? Uh, prior to that, dependent on the, the legacy force, some, uh, yes, did uh, retain them some in, in okay. boots. <coughs> and some didn't have any ARV officers Some didn't have any ARV, like yeah. Dumfries and Galloway yeah. didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, that was just the, the, the variety. Okay, uh, can I ask, I mean, some, they, both the recommendations 8 and 9 of both reports have fairly general sort of implications, not just about the uh, armed policing deployment, but, but uh, I think fairly important recommendations about democratic uh, accountability. I mean, they are dressed up in management speak about comprehensive stakeholder and management processes and so on. Uh, and what's the other one in 10? Yeah. Including mechanisms to capture local authority perspectives. I mean, I do rather wonder what that means in reality, because the, you also... In the uh, agreement that I made last week, you're, you're committing to um, entering engagement with communities and their democratic representatives on policies of significant public interest. I just wonder, into, you know, a lot of local authorities had no idea what was, what was happening. They were not consulted about the deployment of armed police. They weren't consulted about the closures of control rooms and so on. What actually is going to be different in the way in which uh, communities are consulted and the way in which democratically elected representatives are consulted about changes, which are major policy changes, how, how is that actually going to change? Well, I, mean, the, I think I mean, your, your observations on, on our sort of failure to engage and, and consult, I think mm -hmm. we, we, we accept. The, the context I would paint, though, was, it was, a, it was the, the creation of Police Scotland was done in a very, very uh, short time frame in terms of the change of, of both in terms of a policing model and terms of, in terms of the governance model. What we are absolutely committed to doing more of is engaging with the local scrutiny panels, engaging with the existing uh, engagement models that are there. So the local divisional commanders, the local area commanders, they are the individuals who know their communities, know the diverse needs of those communities. And when there is a national issue such as firearms or terrorism or, or online child abuse or cyber, whatever it is, well, actually, we need to make sure that we're, we're communicating those issues and those challenges with local boards and local communities as well. So it is a genuine uh, a period of reflection and commitment from Police Scotland that we do need to make sure that we are engaging right across the whole of Scotland. We're using the networks are there because it's the local commanders, the local police officers who know their, their own communities and making sure that what, what we judge to be the optimum balance between localism and access to the specialist support in the atypical cases when you need it had, we, we have the right balance uh, struck there. So we will commit, we will learn from it, we'll make sure that we use the existing networks that are there, because we probably didn't use them. They were there, they'd been established over many years. Police Scotland mm -hmm. is the service that was there pre pre uh, prior to, to day one. It was based on the, the men and women who were policing the communities who you all know prior to, to day one. So we need to make sure that we utilise those existing uh, uh, routes that were there, because we, we didn't when, when we, went, uh, we made this change and, and we've learnt from that. So in terms of if, if there's going to be a major policy changes un, under consideration, what happens? It goes to SPA, then it comes back to the local communities. What, what's the sort of process that would be undergone in, in order to make sure that communities were properly I, uh, consulted? Well, I was, I, was, I was briefly going to say again, just the, the, the test of, of, let's just take the specific example of that Bernie's got this piece of work in front of him just now about mode of carriage and about maybe a change to the deployment in line with the recommendation from the HMI. So it will come through the police, our own internal structure, it will come to the authority and then beyond that it will then go locally, it will come back to this committee individually, collectively and, and, and this particular issue, I think, is one that we can see and we'll utilise, we'll make sure that, as you say, some of the, 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 the good intention or management language that's used here, how is that going to look in reality? Well, it'll, it'll look in reality when we come and speak to you about modes of carriage and other issues. Yeah, but I'm not just uh, concerned about what, you know, coming to this committee, I'm thinking more about what happens in Dumfries and Galloway, in the Highlands, across yeah. different parts of Scotland, Lo where there have been different legacy forces with different practices. Lo How is that then Lo discussed and communicated? I beg your pardon. Lo lo local commanders into local scrutiny panels, into the existing networks, mm -hmm. into the, the, the third sector, the voluntary groups, community planning partnerships, all the fundamental existing networks, as I said, existed prior to that. We need to make sure that we're maximising that, and that, that will be done. Convener, if I might add to that, what we will be looking for as SPA is 
if where where that hasn't already started or where it hasn't fully concluded, we will be looking for Police Scotland to evidence the work they've done around that, bring us the results of the consultations they've had, and uh, add the the policing view around that so that we can take fully into account all these views uh, as we assess the policy information that Police Scotland bring to us. Uh, we also uh, are engaging ourselves with local authorities particularly. Uh, we, we've been doing that on an ongoing basis since the, the, the start uh, of the Scottish Police Authority but we're bringing again uh, our partnership with COSLA into bear and we will be having another Partners in Scrutiny meeting at the end of this month where we'll be setting out uh, some of those expectations again so that they're aware of, of the, the protocols and, and engagement methods we have in place and so that they know how they can bring issues to us uh, should they wish to, should they be unhappy uh, with, with their relationship uh, at, at, at local level. But I would hope that Police Scotland can solve some of those local relationships through yeah, divisional but, 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 commanders too. Coming first then. Thanks, I was just, if, if it assists, I was only going to give another example from, from here that sits in, under my responsibility in terms of we're changing work about risk and concern hubs. And this is to do with identifying vulnerability, both children and adults. And there's a different process, again, right across the country that impacts upon adult protection committees, child protection committees, community planning partnerships. Really, I like other people to understand, as well as myself, what you're talking about. What is a risk and concern hub? But, I know you use it every sorry. day, but we're mm -hmm. back to management speak. Mm -hmm. You know, just what do you mean in real, ordinary well, working terms? It, 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 it's, it's, it's used as a title to try to say exactly what, what it is. So again, but it doesn't. So well, what I was does trying, it I was, say? Sorry, I beg your pardon. I was trying, I, so ch children at risk. So, if, so a police officer going into a house and identifying, you know, might be there for some other reason, but they identify there's a vulnerable children. How do we uh, make sure that we capture that and then engage with other partners or, or increasingly adults at risk as well? Where there's Sorry? Again. No, no, no. I I do, it, we were answering, we're answering a question, engagement with the community, I was and I was, that's where yeah. we get I was into try, this. I was, trying to, I was trying to use that example. So there, there's a, there's a, in, in, in brief, there's a significant change about creating standardisation, improvement in practice within how the police deal with those issues of concern, but also those issues of risk. Now, that will have a big impact on local authorities, on health boards and others. But before we make that change, we'll make sure that we're engaging, because we're doing that through that local network. That, that, that was my... I was hoping yeah. to use that as an example to try See, the, the and give you that I, reassurance. The thing I don't really understand... I mean, you made re reference to all the channels which were already there. They weren't lost because Police Scotland was formed. Those channels were there. Why would they not...? I know Police Scotland was formed very quickly... But given that those existed in the, in the legacy forces and those channels were there, why were they not used? That's a, that's a, that's a, a good question and a fair challenge, and, and it's a criticism we accept. We need to make sure that we, we reactivate them and, and we use them. We didn't. So I, I, I accept that that is, a, that is a, a, a fair criticism how we went about this particular change. Does this lead back to the Chief Constable? I mean, that you're saying we accept, but it does seem that that was a huge change and there, there seems to be a hand, there was a hand at the tiller, still is, that perhaps was instrumental. Well, you can't really answer that one, no, I don't suspect, no, in no, your I, position, I, I can't, but I'm I, putting the question. I, I can't. The Chief Constable has... I mean, the, the, the change that was introduced in regard to the, the standing firearms authority... It was one I'm that, talking about the whole shebang. Yeah, but the, but that but that particular one that was, is what was one of was one of many many issues that we were faced with as we went from from the chief constable being appointed in October to going live on the first of April. Now yes. what what we what we didn't do, and and the chief relies fundamentally on the advice from people like myself and people like Bernie. What we didn't do, we didn't realise that the level of sensitivity that that change would have. Over, over many other changes. Mr Finney was the first to raise it, and we recognised that we, we should have, we should have recognised that that actually would have a significant impact. We should have explained it more, and, but it was one of uh, numerous other changes that, that we were making and we were trying to place a, a, a judgment on. But the Chief Constable heads up the organisation, but he relies fundamentally on all, as of, all of us as a collective to support them and to inform them and, and to advise them. So it's, it's not the, the Chief Constable ultimately is responsible but he does that with the support, uh, you know, the, the absolute committed support of a senior team such as Bernie and myself. I'll cut, let Alison in. Alison, Thank you. Please. 
Mr White, on the 1st of October 2014, Police Scotland said that ARV officers would no longer be deployed to uh, routine officers. You'll maybe understand my desire for certainty on this, given previous assurances from Police Scotland. Are you sure that that's the case? Well, um, I'm not personally involved in going out and checking exactly what those officers are doing. I have seen internal uh, reports that, that uh, Mr Higgins has, has made uh, to uh, Mr Penman on, on the, the result of the recommendations he had uh, put forward from his uh, inquiry. And I think the other thing that we have enacted uh, is that we now uh, have Vic Emery, who's the chair of the authority, attending the uh, scrutiny group that looks at that deployment, that quarterly review of that deployment issue uh, and, and being part of, of that, that group that oversees that. So in that sense, we're looking at it. Um, if you're saying, how do we know what's happening out there uh, with every police officer uh, every single day. Well, I'm sure these police officers would tell you they are police constables and they have uh, some part of their duty is to use their judgment about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's more about uh, review of, of practice on an individual level and that's an operational matter uh, for policing. But were we to hear of things that were taking place in a way that wasn't in line with policy, then we would be asking the Chief Constable and others to account to the authority for but that. that like well, 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 I might just, thing, might just then... finish this with Mr. Okay. Um, right. that, that, that would be, again, a reactive way of, of, of responding to, to a, a, perhaps a problem arising. So I'm just trying to ascertain what the SPA has done, given that this is such a high-profile issue, and you've done a, a, a thorough report into, into the matter, what you're now doing to assure yourself that the, the assurances you've had from Police Scotland are actually being carried through. Okay. There's, there's a number of things that we'll, we'll go on to, to assure that, that what we've uh, asked has happened. First of all, uh, when we uh, published the report, ACC Higgins came along and gave an immediate response to that, which, although it had some uncomfortable findings for Police Scotland, uh, he gave a positive response and we were pleased to see that. We have asked uh, Police Scotland through the Chief Constable to report to our board meeting in March on their longer term uh, reaction to the recommendations that we have made. In terms of day-to-day -day practice, uh, we review matters as you all do. I'm sure uh, there are uh, whistleblowing methods, there are methods by which the, the public can contact the media, and I think this issue did come up through that happening uh, in the first place. These are, are methods that we would look to. And in terms of day-to-day uh, -day review of practice, uh, we, we are a small organisation overseeing a very large organisation, but we rely on a mixture of things, and Mr Penman's office and, and, and work will uh, help too in assisting in auditing what practice takes place uh, and, and how uh, recommendations are carried forward at an operational level within Police Scotland. Thank you. Convener, if I might now ask turn to Police Scotland on, on the same issue. In well, that's what was, I think that's what in response in. to Mr Stewart, you said uh, they're not tasked or deployed by area control rooms, but if they see a crime committed in front of them. They, they, they will do something. Can you quantify how many occasions uh, armed officers have been deployed since October uh, on what would be fairly routine duties? Um, deployed on routine duties since October, there have been five occasions where uh, police uh, armed response vehicles were dispatched to calls which didn't fit the absolute criteria of being a firearms incident. Um, I have to say three of the um, five incidents that we've identified, I personally believe they do reflect a threat to life because they refer to personal attack alarms, activations um, by victims of uh, domestic abuse, um, and the alarm had been activated by that person. The alarm had been put in place by the police, the person activated it, uh, and the control room took the decision to spend armed response vehicles. My own view is that is a threat to life. However, that's one of the five. The other two uh, where reports of a disturbance um, when uh, the police arrived there was nobody there and uh, the final one was the report of a, a disturbance within a, a public house um, where local officers required assistance to uh, eject a number of people. Now the, the interesting thing about these five incidents um, they all happened on the same day they all happened uh, from the same area control room essentially um, the, the people involved were the same so it's not happened once a week since October. It was one very specific period of time. 
We particularly addressed the individuals involved in that, and there's been no reoccurrence since. Now, in terms of the, the wider governance around that, every day one of my senior armed policing officers, a chief inspector or superintendent, will review all activity undertaken by the armed response vehicles, every single item of work that they've undertaken to satisfy themselves that they have deployed in line with their parameters. In addition to that, uh, area control room supervisors, area control room staff, area control room inspectors um, have been briefed in terms of the, the, the deployment criteria. And in addition, the firearms officers themselves know what their personal responsibility is. So if the, the control rooms try and dispatch them to a call, which they do not believe meets the criteria of a firearms operation or a threat to life, then they will challenge that. Uh, and they will not attend. But, but that, that deals with being um, deployed by the area command rooms, but clearly you, you indicated that the officers were themselves acting um, on their own accord, understandably, when they were out and about. Can you quantify how many housebreakings or other uh, non-life-threatening uh, events that they, they the, themselves took upon themselves to be intervene in? Um, can just refer... I have some papers here, if I can just find the particular, particular section. Well, in the, in the gap, I might um, turn to... Uh, sorry, I have... Yeah. Right, sorry. Sorry, okay. Okay. Right. sorry. so since the, the 1st of October, um, armed response officers have involved themselves in uh, 1,644 uh, instances where they have proactively engaged with members of the public. Um, that will include uh, charging people for uh, offences such as dangerous driving, uh, uh, drink driving and other such like offences. In terms of how many times they have assisted uh, divisional officers or come across where, where there hasn't been a, a police report at the end of it, um, you know, they, they've turned up to assist with a, a missing person search, then I don't have the particular uh, stats to hand. OK, so that's quite a different story, really. So the assurances that we've had that um, police officers are not out on routine issues um, is, is given the lie by these figures, 1,644 incidents where police officers carrying arms are interacting with citizens um, in situations that are not life-threatening. Yeah, I think so, to, to put that contextually, uh, ma'am, um, in year one of Police Scotland, that figure was over 30,000. Um, so I think we can demonstrate that there's been a huge reduction in the number of, of those such interactions. It is just another example, though, of us not being given the full facts. Um, we've been given an assurance by Police Scotland that this was not happening, and it clearly is happening. Whether it's on a reduced scale or not, it is, it, it is still happening. Well, ma'am, with respect, from October, the message that we have consistently said in Police Scotland is that um, the armed response vehicles will deal with uh, firearms operations, threat to lives, and use professional judgment over anything else that they come across. In 1,644 times, they have come across instances where their professional judgment has determined that they should take action. Uh, and I would say that we haven't hidden that fact, uh, and that's what has been consistently said since October. Okay. Okay. Can I turn to Mr Penman? Uh, Mr Penman, your report um, concluded, uh, one of the key findings of your report was that the overt carriage of sidearms and tasers by ARV officers is the best and safest method, method of carriage, and more broadly we consider that overt carriage for ARV duties promotes openness and transparency with the public. Why then, Mr uh, ACC Higgins, are you considering the covert carriage? Why are you taking the time to go through that? Well, first you've asked Mr Penman. So, yeah. Mr Penman, do you want to comment? It, it, I mean, that, that was based on um, some of the technical aspects about where the weapon, where the, the gun is carried uh, mm -hmm. on people and if it's covert in terms of getting that out. So it was deemed to be in terms of best practice and in consultation with Police Scotland as well uh, that we felt that that was the safest and, and, and best place for that. The transparency issue for me is once the firearms are being carried and people are aware of the firearms, I would have a concern then that we move to covert carriage yes. in terms of public confidence and people understanding then the extent to which officers are armed mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, no, no, and I, and I agree with that. I understand that. So why then, uh, ACC Higgins, are you considering 
uh, a report to, to the, the Well, both, both uh, Mr Penman's report and the Police Authority report make it quite clear that uh, the, the conspicuous nature of the firearm um, has caused some public concern in some areas and it has asked us to review our mode of carriage. Now, to carry out a full and frank and transparent review of mode of carriage, we absolutely have to consider um, the, the covert carriage options as well and then assess the safety implications of covert carriage versus overt carriage, uh, as well as the, the public transparency issues around them. But to simply carry out uh, a review of our overt carriage and not consider alternatives uh, certainly wouldn't be in the spirit of, of what Mr Livingston has, has articulated uh, uh, what uh, Police Scotland want to achieve in the future. Well, I mean, certainly in all the, the concerns that communities have raised with me, it, uh, it's not been that the, the, the firearms have been visible, but they've been deployed. So uh, people wouldn't want them to be hidden away and them not to know that they were being carried. That doesn't solve the problem at all. Uh, one final question. I know we're short for time. No, no. Mr White, um, again, um, Mr Penman's report revealed that... Um, 8,000 stop and searches had been carried out by armed officers in the, in, in the time that uh, they were deployed in this way. Has the SPA done any further um, impact assessment of that particular finding? Um, uh, we haven't done no. around that. What we have uh, undertaken is uh, the public attitude survey, and I think that's uh, the first time that's been done on, on this issue at all. Uh, so that shows us that while there are people who are concerned about the, the, the carriage uh, of firearms by some police officers. There was also a slight majority who were in favour of uh, that happening. And, and probably quite critically, there, were, uh, a, a, there was a view amongst people in Scotland that w should they need a police officer to attend an incident, they would want the nearest police officer to attend, whether they were carrying uh, a firearm for other reasons or not. Thank you. I know the time's tight. A very short one, John. It's a comment to, to Mr White, and it was to explain what, what the public anticipate I'm here to do, Mr White, was to understand how a situation comes about that all, police officers in Scotland were deployed in villages, at fets, at charity events. My uh, neighbours are coming across them standing in supermarket queues with firearms. And that was the purpose of many questions, and I assure you we'd be here all afternoon answering <clears throat> the other ones. No, we won't. Yeah, I, I understand we won't. What I would like to comment briefly on is your summary findings at 27 and 28 in your report, which talk about um, the information you were provided with, and it wasn't sufficient depth to, uh, to, to make a decision. Similarly, and I have to say, to use parlance from the criminal justice sector, you, you, you haven't got your story straight, any of you, because there's lots of different versions of who did what, where, John, lots of different John, versions. I think this was a short question. Um, well, so it, you it, can make it is question. A, it, it is it's a very short question. What reassurance, given all these different versions, can you give us that Not there won't be a repetition of this? Because if you say it's something of considered of importance, well, clearly, Mr House did not think this was of importance to highlight and have an open discussion. These were slipped through with mealy-mouthed uh, explanations that no one could possibly interpret would have been the routine deployment of armed officers to non-firearms incidents. So what reassurance can you give us, please? Constable has already explained that matters have moved on considerably from that period uh, back uh, in late 2012, early 2013. Um, we also have the joint agreement that we have put in place uh, as of our last board meeting. And particularly I'm reassured by the views being uh, put forward by Police Scotland around that joint agreement and I the fact that they buy into point. that joint there's, there's agreement. A point, uh, there's a comment in your statement, that, uh, in your report, and that is the issue of community impact, assessment, uh, impact assessments. It, nowhere in any of the answers about how things were going to change was there any use of the term community impact assessments, which is specifically mentioned in your report. In any of the answers we've yes. given today, convener. Well, we fully expect community impact assessments to be undertaken. That is a recommendation we've be, we've made, and we expect Police Scotland to come forward with that information. And as they do, we will be interrogating that and asking them to show us the output of that, so that we can scrutinise that. Can I, can I, I've got just a couple of minutes. I'm going to try and let you get in with your questions, even if they don't get answered. We'll have them on the record. But can I say what seems to come across to the committee is that. Police Scotland, things may have changed and probably have because of the stushy, was pretty cavalier and dismissive of the SPA, and the SPA doesn't seem to have known what it ought to have been doing in terms of scrutiny and accountability. 
Now, that's the way I see it from early days, is that all this thing came out, stop and search, uh, armed police, nothing to do with the SPA. It came out because of the press and members of the public and members of parliament. I think what we're looking for now is a much more robust SPA and a much more communicative Police Scotland, not just to the SPA and the Parliament, but to the public. And we await for that to be delivered. We certainly hope that's going to happen, because I have to say, and I'm looking at the SPA today, I don't think, and I'm not taking you personally, Mr White, I don't think it did its job in ensuring that that was being done, and kind of was able to be put in a side position by the collective of Police Scotland, just blasted on. Now, that, I don't know if that fairly, in some way, represents the way the committee feels that the SPA was not actually on the ball and not insisting that when things came ahead, big decisions like this, that they were in the game at the beginning. Now, I'm not asking you to answer that. I think that's just a point that I think the committee feels we're not at. And I want to let Christian and uh, uh, Graham ask their questions, and we might not have time to answer them, but we'll get them on the record so you get answers back. Christian, do you have a question? Yes, thank you very much, Corina. Uh, I just wanted to explore a little bit the uh, position of the armed officers themselves. Uh, are we... Are we thinking about if we if we can't find the, the, uh, a solution to the problem that those police officers will stay in the police station and stay idle until they, they are called on, and will that have some repercussion on the recruitment of further police officers? Right, that's that question, Graham. Um, first of all, I'd like. Uh, Ian White, in his response, to confirm that I gave evidence to himself and his colleague very much in the tenor of the frustration expressed by the convener eh, this afternoon. I think my question is, at paragraph 38, a clear accountability framework exists. I think we would expect, eh, accept that Ian White is probably the eh, expert in accountability as far as this situation is concerned. So with that hat on, He's spoken about recommendations. He's spoken about consultation. Does a chief constable have the authority to make such changes in policy in the future without prior endorsement from a Scottish police authority? That's a question. And you've got a question as well. well no, I have um, a query, really, I suppose, for yourself, convener. Um, I have a number of other questions that I would like to ask um, this afternoon. We are not able to do it justice today. I would like to reconvene the committee with, with the well, panel uh, to, to, to further explore the I think I think a good issue would be if members have further questions for this they wish to put, we will write in the first instance for responses. That doesn't by any way say we're not going to meet again, but we can ask your questions, Alison, anybody else, um, and then we could reconvene with their answers in front of us on top of it, if you wish. It's just a way of normally doing, allowing people to... Well, we wouldn't finish this meeting unless we were constrained by time. Whether well, there any more questions. If it was a normal committee meeting, we Correct. would carry on. Correct. And therefore, I think we should be carrying on taking oral evidence. Well, uh, all I'm saying is to give the opportunity to ask your questions. Let's, let's discuss this um, okay. at, at the end of the meeting, okay. the, the manner in which we try to do it. That's most effective for the committee, which I know is always trapped by the fact that we've got to be in the chamber at 2.30. Um, can I say a thank you for your evidence so far? Uh, I'm sure that you know there's still a great deal of discontentment uh, in this committee and that we're very much watching the guardians are being guarded by us, if you like it, put it like that. Thank you very much. Yeah.